Well, hi, everyone, and welcome to Dementia Chats. I'm Lori LeBay, the founder of Alzheimer Speaks and a daughter whose mother had dementia for 30 years. Um, for those of you that are new, Dementia Chats uh, is a platform where we have a, a very interesting conversation um, and the voice of those living with dementia are our experts. And so we're gonna go around and just have everybody introduce themselves. And True, I'm gonna have you start, please. My full legal name is Truthful Loving Kindness. I am assistant administrator for Dementia Mentors and I have an award-winning blog. Those take most of my time. And I'm with DAA and other assorted advocacy stuff. My uh, diagnosis is still mild cognitive impairment because my vascular and Lewy body symptoms are so slow in progressing. Okay, great. Thank you. Lori? My name is Lori Scher, and I was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's and FTD. Um, I'm very active with Dementia Action Alliance and Dementia Mentors, and i um, do some speaking and a lot of other things. Okay, great, thank you. Michael? My name is Michael Ellenbogen and I'm an international dementia advocate and connector. I was uh, diagnosed uh, with uh, semantic dementia and, uh, or possibly SNAP. Uh, and uh, now I uh, try to uh, basically uh, live my life to the fullest. Great. Thank you, Bob. My name is uh, Bob Savage. I was diagnosed with early stage Alzheimer about two years ago, three years ago. And uh, I am a uh, advocate and my primary purpose is to help to reduce the stigma related to dementia. Great. Thank you. So today's topic is going to be about um, dementia friendly. And I'm going to go ahead and throw it to Michael to kind of explain what, what all we're going to be talking about. I am trying to get input from the folks who are here today uh, who are living with dementia to speak up on what it means to them to have a dementia friendly community in their, their area. Uh, I want to know if they already have one in their area. And if not, what city and state they're in and what they would like to see. Uh, did they even play a role in trying to create a dementia-friendly community? And if they ran into any issues trying to do that, uh, what are the things they would like to see happen or what are the things they have already seen happen as a part of dementia-friendly communities? And what things would help them to live life to the fullest by having dementia-friendly communities? So they're some of the things that I would uh, like to bring up. And of course, if they have some other issues or things they'd like to bring up related to that topic, I'd be very interested in hearing about it. Okay, so why don't we start out um, having everyone just say if, they're, if they have a dementia-friendly community or group trying to get off the ground in their area. And True, I'm going to start with you. We don't even have an Alzheimer's Association group any closer than three hours away. Um, there is nothing, to my knowledge, about dementia friendly in the area. Okay, and do you mind stating where your what your area is? So, oh, I'm in Fort Bragg, Mendocino, California. Okay, great. Uh, Lori, how about you? Now, I'm like true. I live in the country. Um, I'm in Ole, Pennsylvania, and we don't have have anything going. Okay, um, Michael. Well. Uh, I'm in Pennsylvania, and uh, I, I will tell you, I've spent probably almost five years now, maybe a little bit longer, trying to bring dementia-friendly communities to this area, and uh, we actually were fortunate enough to finally get that started in December of last year, and uh, Doylestown, uh, Pennsylvania is the first of its kind here. And uh, we now have, I guess, a number of people starting to do that process. We're, again, at the beginning stages of it. We've had some uh, multiple meetings and uh, brought together a lot of people here. And we are starting to see it spread uh, to the, uh, I think, possibly the Lehigh Valley. And most recently, I heard that the Abington area may now be taking that on also. Uh, so. 
it, it, it is starting to spread here in Pennsylvania, and we do have the secretary behind this, uh, the Secretary of Aging, uh, Secretary Osborne. So I, I think we are starting to finally make some headway here. Okay, great. Um, Bob, uh, do you have a dementia-friendly community up and running or starting? Yeah, we uh, have been, uh, we have a full-time person now here at Livewell who takes the lead on developing dementia-friendly communities. And we selected a, a town where we live, where I live, and, uh, and we, we're, we're gonna try to make that the model for uh, spreading it across the country. And we've now uh, come up with dementia, we probably now have with our, with our presentations, and the presentations are uh, pretty powerful, but at the end of the presentation, we asked the people to, to do three or four things that they could do to help reduce dementia. And now we have close to 400 people that we worked with, and the, uh, the town leaders are so excited about doing this. And it's, it's a very thrilling thing to, to, to be part of. Great. I'll just throw in, um, I'm, I live in uh, Maplewood, Minnesota, and Maplewood isn't dementia friendly. I had approached them, but my sister city, Roseville, is extremely active. Good. And we have, oh, we've done all kinds of things. Plus, there are a lot of, um, a lot of communities in Minnesota have gone through the um, Act on Alzheimer's project, and a lot of that funding has gone away. And so, but they're still sustainable in their actions. And so that's been uh, very exciting to see. I think that, you know, and as I travel around the country, it's it's really kind of a hit or miss thing. But what I have seen is the conversations surrounding this and the interest in this is really gaining speed and um, a lot of momentum. Lori? Michaels, tell me about the program. What is the program and, and what do you mean by dementia friendly? What are businesses doing to make themselves dementia friendly? Well, I have to tell you, Lori, we're, we're at the very beginning stages and I've actually partnered with uh, organization called Dementia Society of America and uh, what we've done first is we've reached out to people like the mayor, uh, various businesses, hospital, uh, and anybody in that Doylestown area uh, including you know uh, first responders and things like that and people from the banking world and we've pulled them into a meeting even though there's some preliminary information out on Dementia Friendly America site, we want to find out what will work for our location in Pennsylvania. So we're really opening up the doors to these folks to really try to determine what is needed for Doylestown. We're opening up the doors to all people who are impacted from a standpoint of uh, people who have issues related to any kind of anything related mentally. I believe if we can help people with dementia, we can help all people, including the older population who also may be struggling and need help. So it's not strictly focused to dementia-friendly community exactly uh, because, again, AARP, I don't know if you're familiar, came out with something that uh, is in Florida that they're doing which pertains to all people uh, who are older living in environments like that uh, and they also need help so I think when we talk about dementia friendly communities I think it helps all people all sector I think if we can make that work in Pennsylvania it's going to affect everybody and um, we're really allowing the community to decide what's needed now I have a lot of ideas what's needed but we really want the people in the business sector to really determine what they can do and how they're going to be able to do it because we don't want to come out and say this is what has to happen because I think when you start telling people what has to happen I think you end up losing uh, I guess what is needed because what may be good for one community may not be good for this community, if you know what I'm saying. One of the things we're hearing a lot about around the nation is since Dementia Friendly came up, we're hearing more and more about age friendly. And so all ages and, and so there's kind of this competition out there with funding of what are we going to be and who are we going to support and 
what's the biggest net to capture? And so it's, it's kind of interesting to watch um, how that is all happening. And it'll be interesting to see how that progresses over time too. But I'm a, I'm a firm believer that what's good for dementia is really good for, good for everyone. Getting to, to Lori's question in terms of, does anybody here maybe have a definition of what they would like for dementia friendly? Because I haven't seen a, a truly great definition. I mean, they're kind of open-ended and everybody's using them a little bit different. And, and I have to say, I, I see the need for that because even on one of the committees I'm on for national, they wanted it to be so specific and it can't be because every community has different resources and different needs. So true. When I asked what was the definition of dementia friendly, one of my friends, Helga Rora, spoke up and she says, dementia friendly should be defined with those with dementia from those with dementia. Well, I agree. I mean, you guys are living and breathing it. And, you know, the so-called expert of which I'm categorized as one too, we don't know. We're not, we're not living it and breathing it every day. You know, we might be participating in it and walking alongside it, but it's still, it's still very different. And I, and I, you know, that's the whole point of having these dementia chats is to get your your voice out there. Michael? When we talk about dementia-friendly communities, it, it has to start with the people living with this disease. There is no doubt about that. I, I will also say, I don't think anybody out there has gotten it right yet. I think we're on the right track to, I guess, get the right input from people, but we need more input from the people who are living with the disease and to be involved with the process to basically figure out in their own area what is needed and how it, it will be implemented. I, I think what is really needed, and I've been saying this for years, is I think we need kind of like the Bible of all the places who have implemented something to do with dementia friendly communities and to have a long list of what they have done to address in their area. From there, to be able to try to figure out what can be utilized in the individual community where we live at now to find out what's going to work to make our lives live life to the fullest and to still be able to be a part of society so we can live within our communities and to address our need. I think that's what we have to work towards and what may be on those lists might not be everything that's still needed. And I think it's going to be on an ongoing addition that we have to add on to those lists as we continue to refine the different things that are needed to help each of us. And again, we're all different, as we all know, and we all have different needs. So I think it's important to identify what those needs are. But I also think it's important that we are inclusive of everything that happens around us because without having everybody's input in the community for the various lines of businesses and hospitals and uh, government, we're not going to be able to succeed unless they're all play a role in it. Okay, uh, Lori and then Bob. To me, dementia-friendly community needs to start with dementia-friendly business. Um, I think, for example, restaurants need to develop something like the Purple Table, where they have a area reserved for people with dementia or autism or other challenges that don't have speakers, don't have televisions, where the menu specials are in writing instead of just rattling them off. The waiter or waitress knows to be attentive to the needs. To have a dementia-friendly grocery store where when you go in, if you can't find something that they actually take it take you to it or that they open up a line for you to go through the, the checkout instead of stand there listening to the scanning and and the carts and all that that background noise i think it starts one business at a time um, before it can be a community the businesses need to be able to change the way they act because that's really what what is um causing us confusion is the individual businesses not necessarily the whole community. Bob? We now have about 12 people who are the power of people 
from Southington. We have the pastor, we have the police commissioner, we have the library, we have the art museum, we have a lot of, and they're all, uh, we're now going into our third meeting and they are all uh, coming up with a, a plan on how their particular representation could do to improve Dementia Friends. And so it'll be interesting to see what comes from the whole group. Okay, go ahead, True. For me, probably the primary thing would be the hospital wristband project. I think that is terrifically important. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. I'm gonna just um, piggyback on Lori's comment about dementia-friendly communities, you know, starting with the businesses. In Roseville, where I'm at, we purposely didn't go to the businesses first. We went to the people first. And so the last couple of years, we've actually been focusing on educating the public and trying to get our community to grow in terms of need before we start approaching businesses. Because as a team, we felt we needed to have a better base in terms of needs so we could say hey we're having 100 people once a month coming to these educational programs at the library we've partnered with the the city the library and the school district so we have some power positions there and some training has been done with some of those as well and they've really really added like our library system has memory minder kits where people can pick those up and, and take those out. They don't have to scoot through the whole library looking for different things. They'll have an engagement piece, and an educational piece, uh, um, either audio or video piece in it. Um, and that's worked, worked really, really well. Um, some of our members have gone out and trained, let's say the city staff, police, fire, um, EMS workers, and then just even desk staff at the city to be dementia aware. They've done a virtual tour um, one of our communities is uh, licensed for that. So they had police and fire and EMS do the virtual tour, which was absolutely fabulous for them. They were shocked. They were just shocked after going through that. And that was a real eye opener. So we've been kind of sliding in the door in a, in a different way. Northern Colorado um, with Cindy Lazinski is doing some really cool stuff. And she has specifics for all different kinds of businesses out there. And she has probably one of what I have seen traveling the country, one of the best grassroots efforts going. And she's trained hospitals, you name it. And she just keeps adding to her collection of, of tips that they have when they do these educational programs specific to, you know, if it's a um, beautician or, or grocery store or bank or whatever it is, but all of them have a little different tips, little twists to them. So Bob, you're raising your hand, so go ahead. Just uh, on the group that we have, the only business representation we have our restaurant and we're starting there and so uh there's a lot of interesting things around that and how to approach it and the so uh i'm agreeing with you that uh, uh we, we're going to go to the larger business a little later mm -hmm. now are you are you using the purple table this is one of the considerations that the re that the restaurant representative is looking at okay because I, I love that concept with the app that people can tap into to be yeah. able to find it, make a reservation. It just, it, it seems to make a lot, of, a lot of sense. Michael, did you have a comment or Lori? I can't remember who in that corner it was. I was just uh, wondering if True could talk more about the wristband project to enlighten us on that. It's a project for hospitals that I believe when a person, is, when a patient is admitted, they do a short ex memory for dementia type exam, and it shows that a person is at risk for a dementia type um, condition. Not that they have it, but they are at risk. And so the personnel are like, not to ask them, are you taking this medication? When's the last time you did this and such? Where do you live? Um, unless, someone else is around them that can answer that question accurately. And some of the other considerations for dementia that if they have a purple wristband or whatever the key is for their hospital, that personnel know enough about dementia type conditions and know to check 
to look and see if they have a wristband before some of the actions. That's a great program, and I, and I think that is really needed throughout the U.S. Uh, it was actually started by Gary LeBlanc, and uh, I, I think uh, – we all need to expand upon that even further, uh, but I think it's a good start in all hospitals uh, because I think uh, by identifying the people who have this, I, I think uh, it raises awareness to the fact of they have a special need when they're there. I agree with that. It's a fantastic program. And maybe maybe what we should talk about next, because I can't believe we've gone through a half an hour already, but some of the benefits to the changes in, in what you'd like to see. So in the hospital, why don't we talk about why this program is important? How does it benefit not only the person with dementia, but the staff and the family? Michael? I have to tell you, uh, I'm a great supporter of that program because uh First of all, uh, they've been able to identify people who actually have issues that weren't even aware of issues uh, when they were first coming into the hospital. So I think from that standpoint, the program's been really great because some people come into the hospital and don't even know they have an issue. And uh, in some cases, they're able to uh, be sent to further checkup or to another doctor uh, which in turn, uh, they've been able to eliminate their issues of dementia, uh, you know, because it was e either caused by UTI or uh, some drugs that they were on. So I, I think there's been great benefits from that. Uh, secondly, I, I think it's good that people are identified who have uh, some form of dementia when in the hospital, because what it does is uh, it allows for not only the nursing staff, uh, but it also allows in some hospitals, they actually have, I think they're called, uh, uh, what are they called? Babysitters. Uh, they, they actually uh, allow somebody to be in the room with the person who has uh, the uh, cognitive issues to have some additional support and also to help them along with uh, helping them choose their menus of food and things like that. And, uh, you know, it, it also makes the people aware in the hospitals that these folks may have some cognitive decline and therefore can't always answer the questions that they would expect a normal person to be able to be applied to. Uh, I, I can tell you, I was in a hospital myself and uh, I mean, you know, you know, sometimes they think it was from the medication that I was having difficulties and it wasn't the medications, it was just me. Uh, so, you know, uh, there's a lot of confusion that goes along with that. and. Uh, I think it, it helps to understand what the person's capable of doing and not able to do. And sometimes they won't ask you to perform various tasks that they would have expected a normal person to do. I think there's some real great benefits from that program. And uh, I hope to see a lot of hospitals taking on those steps. I can tell you uh, the hospital in my area now is now moving towards that. And uh, again, this was a hospital that I wasted five years on and wasn't able to make any progress. And now because we're doing Dementia Friendly uh, America in our area, they're now starting to follow that and they're working internally to uh, reach those goals. So I, I, I think there is great benefits to hospitals doing this uh, throughout the, not only the U.S., but the world. Mm -hmm. Anybody else want to add on to the hospital wristband program? True. When they do the hospital training, they also make people aware of the medication sensitivities for Lewy body, which can is a big saving on lives. It's a big source of death for Lewy body is medication problems. I think adding on to the wristband program too is just more hospitals I think are getting more sensitive to if, if a person with dementia is admitted that they might need somebody to stay with them 24 7 and so some hospitals are starting to recruit volunteers or assigning staff if family's not able to go and that has helped reduce a lot of incidents and stress for both I think well, for all, the patient, the, the family, and the staff. With that true? I've stayed with a couple of people in the hospital. And um, one of them, she had to be in restraints 24-7 if I wasn't there. Mm -hmm. If I was there, then the restraints could be off and she could be much more relaxed. I mean, who wants to be? 
physically restrained into a bed 24 7. Exactly. Why don't we talk about some other things like banks? What would you like to see different with banks? Anybody have a comment on that one? That seems to be a, a big issue for a lot of people in terms of their their finances. Michael? Well, I, I, I think banks play a real important role, uh, especially as we progress. Uh, I, I think they need to, number one, try to determine if we're being scammed uh, because a, a lot of us can get scammed and uh, we might go into the bank and take money out that we might be giving it to the wrong person. And I think uh, banks could play a huge role in that. Or if you're writing a lot of checks out uh, and you're sending checks out, uh, I, I think they can figure things out. Or, you know, the, in my case, I did duplication of checks. Uh, I, I paid the same people more, more than once. Uh, so it, it, it's things like that that I think the banks can do that. And there's automated processes that they could create to be able to pick up uh, that kind of information just through IT. Uh, so that, that, that's one goal. I mean, the other thing is, uh, you know, when I go into a bank, you know, I can't always figure out how to fill out those forms anymore. So I think just helping people to uh, fill out the forms and figure out what our needs are when we go into the bank would be very helpful. There's, there's many other ways, you know, that banks could help also. To me, that there, there's some key issues that can easily be done. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, I think today there's a fear that they can't just suddenly say something because they feel that they might get reprimanded for doing some of those things. Uh, and uh, I, I think we need to kind of take that away from them and let them feel that they are able to speak up and, and talk to people to help them out. Well, I think with banks and financial planners, I've seen um, – seen that an issue where, you know, some of them will say, well, well, I'm not a counselor. That's not my job. You know, this is what I'm supposed to do. But I think if, if banks and financial, um, even financial planners would come up with a form that says, if I'm seeing signs of something, who's a backup person that I can contact that so we can pull into a group and not everybody's going to feel comfortable signing that. But I think a lot of people would be willing to um, have that added layer of protection because they can pick up on maybe um, irregular patterns from what you've done in the past. And I think that that's critical. Or having one thing that drove me crazy as a care partner was I would go to the bank with my mom and she would have a $90 check. And I wasn't going to open up an account for, for that for her because it was in, it was out, and then it would cost her money to have this account. So would put it in my account so that I could just write it back to whoever, if it's beauticians or whatever. And I would tell you every single time, they're like, well, we need your power of attorney. I'm like, I can't tell you how many times I brought the power of attorney in, how many times they scanned the power of attorney, but nobody could ever find it in their banking system. And we all know that that's a quick key code to have a document. And then you have to train staff of where to find those documents. But it was so frustrating. I almost pulled out of all my stuff out of that bank. I was like this close because it was like, this is such a waste of time. And I get that they have to be protective, but they also need to, if they're going to scan something, then they need to know how to access it to satisfy their customers too and meet the needs. Because it was, it was ridiculous in terms of that or helping people um, identify if they're having difficulty, like you said, making making change or filling out forms or, or whatever, simplifying some different things, or maybe doing a one-on-one -on -one personal banker instead of having to stand in line, like the good old days where you could actually have a conversation and get to know somebody in a bank. I, I don't know if we can ever get back to those days, though. So I, I think there's lots of things that can be can be done um, or setting limits on certain cards. People have asked for that too, when they've got a power of attorney and then they'll say, well, we can't limit this person. If once they're a signer, then they have unlimited signing abilities. And yet they know a person has dementia. They understand why there should be a limit. I can't imagine how that can't be instituted either. Lori? They are very governed by the Federal Reserve and their rules and regulations. So it's not always the bank that does that. It's the mm -hmm. Federal Reserve that 
comes up with those. If I could ask my bank to do one thing, it would be stop sending me all the advertisements and propaganda. I don't want any more credit cards. I don't want, and they get me, they get very confusing. Um, we probably go to the bank twice a year. Um, we do everything electronic um, or withdraw at the ATM. So I don't really go into the bank very often, but because our banking is done electronic. We get we get emails constantly saying, "Oh, you need to redo your mortgage or take out a home equity loan." Or love to see the advertisements just stop. <laughs> yeah, that's a really really good one. All that extra junk mail that people get. That's a that's a fantastic one to be able to opt out of that. Same with kind of even cable. I know I get I, I get two or three every week in my P.O. box, plus at home. And it's just like, I can't believe how much money they're spending on on different things. But yeah, that's a, junk mail is a really good one. Michael? Absolutely. Uh, the junk mail was such a huge problem for my mother who had uh, some form of dementia. Uh, she, she would constantly call my wife. I got another thing. What do I have to do? The bank sent me this paperwork. And it, it, it just became such a nuisance because every time she got a request, my mom didn't know what to do with it because she couldn't understand things anymore. And it just really made her life more miserable. Not to mention my wife, who was constantly taking care of my mom for me. Uh, so I, I think that is such a great point. You know, for people who have dementia, we don't need all that paperwork. It just creates havoc. I, I understand they want to advertise to people, but I think for people like us, limit the amount of information that's sent to us. Yeah. Well, and the same with the phone calls, too. And I don't know, that do not call list doesn't seem to be as effective as we'd all like. But um, if there was a way to do that as well, because it really is, you know, it, you're vulnerable in terms of people can get involved with stuff that really isn't appropriate. And for some people that can, that can turn into a major, major mess. I had an aunt that had uh, dementia and anytime somebody sent her anything like the free address tags or a bookmark, whatever, she sent the money. So she was sending money to the Democrats. She was sending money to the Republicans. She was sending money anti-abortion, and she was sending money pro-abortion. All they had to do was send her anything, and she said, oh, well, I have to pay them for it. And trying to get people off a list once they donate once, that, that is a, all the junk mail is a concern. Well, in charities, aren't they a protected list? So that they don't have to do the do not call. I know politicians aren't included in the do not call list and and stuff. And again, if if it's looked at almost from a, as a vulnerable adults type issue, you know maybe that could be that could be changed. Let's go on to like grocery stores because a lot of people get out to the grocery stores. Um, what what could be done there, Lori? I I go to Giant in Gilbertsville and I love my grocery store. They know me, and if I go in and I can't find something, um, I can walk up to any one of them, and they will take me directly to it, put it in my cart, say, is this what you want? Put it in the cart. Um, if, they, if there's a line and they see me coming, they open up a line for me or send me over to customer service. They are just really fantastic. They understand that the scanning really bothers my head. So they don't make me stand in line. I think that is just fantastic customer service. Deli department, they know what I usually order. They have it, have it listed under the counter. And so when I go up, they'll say, do you want the roast beef the provolone? And they know what brand and everything I want. And that is, I, I mean, they're just great. That's a benefit of a small town <laughs> versus big city. Um, Bob? Lori, how did you pull that off? How did you set that up? That's kind of an interesting question. I was doing a video on the strategies I use for grocery shopping, which include hanging my bags and my purse on the cart because I was walking away with other people's carts. <laughs> and I went to Giant and asked to speak with the manager, and I said, this is going to be a very strange request, but could I borrow a cart? So I explained to him that I have dementia and how many issues I have grocery shopping and that I was doing a video on how I grocery shop. In order to demonstrate that, I needed to borrow a shopping cart. And he let me borrow the shopping cart. And um, 
then he watched the video, which of course I mentioned giant in, and he showed it to all the employees. And then we just kind of started a di dialogue from that, but it was really just because I wanted to borrow a shopping cart. Well, that's great though. That's, that's great in how they took interest. And I think the interest is there, but it's like, how do you start that conversation? And you were already in the process of trying to do something to make change. So I'm going to go to Bob and then it almost look, it looks like true. And maybe Michael had comments. I have to ask you, why did you, why were you borrowing the cart? I was doing a video. I got it now. I got it. On okay. how I do my grocery shopping. When I do my grocery shopping, I have a, one of those big seat clamps and I hook my bags and my purse on the cart because I was, losing my purse, losing my phone, walking away with other people's carts, and that helps me to identify my cart. Okay. True, you had a comment? I wanted to mention that I ended up in tears at the service counter when I still went to, with my husband to do groceries, which has been a couple of years ago, uh, because I would get separated from him, and somehow in my mind, it I, it occurred to me that he would drive home without me. <laughs> and so I was in tears twice and um, went to the service counter. And both times the people did not understand at all, probably even what the word dementia meant. I mean, I had a thing that said, since I could, you know, under stress, I can't remember my words. I couldn't remember the word dementia, but it was, I either had my, um, my ID, a neck chain or else a business card in my pocket that I gave them that said I had dementia symptom problems and, um, you know, please be patient with me or something like that. And, but they were totally out of their comfort zone. They had no idea what to do. Their perception was more to watch out. I might hurt somebody almost. <laughs> it was, it, it, it was bad. I think that is part of what I would like to see changed in dementia friend. Understanding of what it is so that they have some idea when there are problems of what they can do. Okay. One thing I want to make sure we cover is restrooms because restrooms is an issue all over the place for people. And so what would we like to see changed with restrooms? Lori? Get rid of the blow dryers. Okay, tell people why. That noise is horrible and it really messes with our heads. Okay, true. And me personally, that's why God made pants <laughs> is for drying my hands because I, I can't stand the sound of that. But yeah, we can choose not to use the dryer, but other people are using the dryer in the room. And so it's, we're still, our brain is still going crazy from the dryer, even if we figure out a way to not use it personally. Yeah. Well, isn't it too, it's the noise and just, I mean, and then the blowing too. I've seen people just jump from that because a lot of times you don't even have to have your hand under it or in it. And it's, it can scare. I've seen a lot of people get scared by that as well. What, what do you think about the sinks where you put your hands under and it's supposed to know you're there? All the disorientation of the various faucets and the soap dispensers. I, it, bathrooms are a terrible thing for me. I've written about it several times um, because by the time I go through the severe stress of trying to work the faucet, trying to get the toilet to flush, trying to work the soap dispenser, trying to get my hands dry, and then there's three different hallways to decide how to get out of the dinged place um i by the time i succeed in getting out i have no idea where i am i have no idea who my husband is i have it, it's it's terrible michael yeah i have uh, similar problems you know that, that's mentioned but i'll I tell you i'm actually getting more confused with the signs for bathrooms anymore believe it or not you know sometimes i can't tell the men from the women anymore and I'm always afraid that I'm going to end up in the woman's 
bathroom because some of these things are just not clear. And I wish they would make it clear to, to just say woman or man or something very clear from the picture. But the pictures that they're using anymore are just, for me, became very confusing. Uh, and uh, I, like I said, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to walk into the woman's bathroom sometimes because of that. I've heard a lot of people talk about they'd like to see more family bathrooms because as their person progresses, sometimes they have to go in and assist and they can't in these big public bathrooms or in airports or malls, you know, like Drew was saying, there's more than one exit. So somebody's standing outside the door waiting for somebody and they've gone out the other side and nobody knows that they went out the other side. And then there's panic on everybody's side trying to figure out what's what. I was glad you brought up the, the flushing of the toilets too, because is it going to flush itself? Do I have to do it? Is it a push? Is it a pull? Is it a, you know, because there's so many variations with that in the the soap dispensers, it would be nice just to go back to the towels. So you just pull them out, not even the ones that automatically come out because they get jammed. And then how do you, how do you figure them out? But yeah, there's just so many different issues, I think, with the restroom. And we haven't even touched on color and lighting on top of that for people, which um, can be, you know, some of that stuff can be really helpful as well for for people would anybody else have input on bathrooms restrooms true another big issue with all of them is flooring and sound in sound are you talking about the echoing that you can get in there almost need some sound panels to to do some absorbing the, and the echoing and the music <laughs> if there's music going i can't hear anyone and i can't think okay. i can either focus i can my mind goes to the music and anything else is lost including where i am okay when you can you expand on flooring various patterns wave well, you know how our, our tremors well at least my tremors a lot of people have have with dementia have tremors and it, it's kind of the same way with patterns on the floor they waver and it, it makes and Patterns create other patterns or create pictures and distortions make it really difficult for me to walk. Um, you know, I'll knock into the walls, etc. If it, uh, patterns on the floors are problems. Yeah, one of my favorites was when Norm talked about walking into a uh, I can't remember if it was a store or whatever, but it was green carpet and then it had. Uh, gold flowers and but they had you know kind of long um, stems and he thought they were snakes coming up at him and that was just a perfect example of the patterns but also the colors a lot of times they'll have an, an edge around it where they'll have a dark edge and the floor is white and then people think that it's a hole you know or that it's no longer a level surface and so there's just so many things to consider in terms of design and um, not having things that will glare, you know, like in the restaurants, a lot of times they're laminated and, and I know even my eyes, um, I have difficulty and I'm, I pull out my phone and my flashlight sometimes to be able to read a menu because it's just not written well. Um, so there's a, a lot of stuff with design um, and color choice from physical environment to supplemental um, things, uh, choice of font, the colors a lot of times I see are real almost pastel on pastel and people can't differentiate things. Um, Lori, you had some comments? Hotels I think have gotten to be one of the worst. What was that? Hotels. Oh, hotels. Mm -hmm. be horrible. Whereas they think, oh, they're making it so nice and so modern looking. Um, I was in a hotel recently where there, the uh, flooring was like a mosaic, and I, I really didn't know where to walk. Couldn't figure it out. And then in my room, I, I actually got up to go to the bathroom, and I was afraid to walk on the carpet because I didn't understand what it was. Then I'm in the, I, I'm washing my hands, go to dry them, and turn the way I usually do in my bathroom. And the shower was a glass door, or in fact, it was all glass, and I slammed right into the glass. They need to have like designs on the glass or something because it's very confusing to, especially in the middle of the night when you're already a bit disoriented anyway, 
um, to not walk into a solid glass. Before we started, um, Bob, you had talked about um, hotels and all the doors looking the same and and numbers being small. To um, True, I'm going to go back to True and then Bob. Okay. I just remembered a, a number of my friends are now having problems and needing the toilet a different color than the floor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now you're talking toilet or toilet seat? Probably toilet seat would be fine. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Okay. Um, Bob, did you want to add something? Yeah. One of the problems with going to a hotel, uh, they're usually in hallways. It's all the same color. All the doors are the same. You, and they're all in different directions. It can be very confusing finding your hotel, mm -hmm. your hotel room, because uh, you know sometimes you happen to forget the number. <laughs> and yep. uh, so, I think uh, the rooms themselves should be better marked. Yeah, one of the things I will say when we went on our dementia-friendly cruise that I did like. Um, that um, was done was having everybody had their own kind of little um, front door decoration that was different. But in a hotel, you know, you kind of isn't you might get the kids playing games and switching everybody up too. I don't know how that would how that would work, but I could see that 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 happening. But that I, that helped a lot of people, and including myself, in terms of figuring out. Oh, here we are. This one's ours. And then it was kind of fun to see what everyone else had on their door, too. You know, it gave you something to think about as in, in kind of markers as you were going down the hallways, um, which, is, which is interesting. I think also in the hotels, it would be nice for them to have alarms for the doors, you know, just portable door alarms, because I know sometimes people worry that somebody's going to leave during the night when they're sleeping a care partner. And those can be purchased fairly inexpensively, just in case, um, you know, somebody was a, would happen to wander out. Bob? Yeah, this is that, that little piece of paper or card you had to unlock the door with. Mm -hmm. You never know if it's this way, if it's that way, if it's that way. You don't, and if you're right, you don't know if you're right. It, it's, it's all, to me, it's all hit and, hit and miss. Yep. Well, I found out something the other day, and I've never had this problem because I, I have like a little pouch on the back of my phone, and I will put my card there, and they're like, oh, no, it'll deactivate it. So I go back to the front desk if it's too close to your phone. I'm like, okay, well, that's something new I learned. But, boy, that, I mean, <laughs> that makes it inconvenient, too. So, um, you know, not all of these things are we going to be able to to fix, but I think we've gone over – quite a few um, different variables. Um, anybody want to add anything else? One of the things that I, I would like to talk about just really quickly um, is social events that you can participate in, like the uh -oh. Giving Voice Choir, I think has been, I, I've just heard such phenomenal things about that, but um, still, or, or the memory cafes, you know, that are popping up where um, people with dementia and their care partners can get together in community and feel safe and have fun and and um, really build friendships. I think, to me, that is also one of the keys to a dementia-friendly community is allowing people access and to be, to still feel like they're a citizen and that they are um, still able to give back to their community, if it's volunteering or whatever it is. And I think that we still have to create more opportunities on that social side. And I'd like to see more funding going in to developing some of those social things than just always pharma too. Because you know what I hear from, from all of you with dementia is how important it is to stay engaged and to feel purposeful. And, and that is one thing that we haven't, we haven't really said here, but I think that that's one of the, a real big key in terms of, you know, you can't have dementia friendly without having you involved, period. You know, then it's just words. Um, we need the actions to follow up and to be inclusive and to make sure that your voice is heard and integrated in terms of what is truly needed because sometimes we're not right you know we see a need and you're going eh, 
I can live with that, but I'd really like you to fix over here, you know, but we're not, we're not having that second half conversation because we're not even allowing your voice to be heard. We're not always asking the right questions. And, and I think also in um, kind of wrapping up with this whole dementia friendly piece, I think it is critical for us not to get overly structured that we lose the creativity to develop something new because I mean, the wristband program was something new. The giving voice choir was something new. Um, you know, the girls playing tag football was something new. Um, you know, there's there's so many, the memory cafes, they're all, they all tweak them just a little bit different so that we make sure that we're meeting the needs and that we are leveraging those involved, their passions, their interests, and their skill sets. And, and I think when we get overly structured, we lose that and we lose our oomph um, to keep going and our sustainability because it's, I think it's the creativity and people really purposeful behind it that keeps the momentum going, that ignites others to get involved and, and gives hope, you know, for a better life for everybody. So, um, Michael, any, any last thoughts that you have? This was a great topic. Thank no, you. I mean, this is a topic that we could probably talk for hours. I mean, we only, I think, covered one or two, three uh, different, uh, I guess, uh, areas. But, I mean, you know, you, you mentioned airports. My God, I could go on forever with airports. But, no, this was great. Mm -hmm. True. Anything else you'd like to add? Okay. Lori, how about you? Yeah, it, it's sad because there are programs out there for seniors, um, programs at the Y, programs at the community center, shopping events for seniors. But even though you have dementia, you're not 65, so you can't go. Mm -hmm. And that, I, I, that's really sad. That's really sad because those would be the people that you probably could socialize with because there's a number of them, mm -hmm. especially in a small community, trying to locate people with dementias. It's difficult to find people living with dementia. Um, and so they refer you to the senior centers, but yet you're not allowed to participate in the senior centers. I mean. Yeah, good, good point. Bob, anything you'd like to add? No, thank you. I'm fine. Okay. Um, the other thing I guess I, I want to just throw out is kind of that arts and culture piece too. We didn't really get into to that as much. And, you know, a lot of the museums are doing different things. And um, there's, there's, there's just so many cool, cool things that are out there. Or even um, the adult day programs and respite programs. And how are those devised? And what do they look like? And in Montana, they have a, um, a farm versus um, a building, per se, for adult programs. So there's lots of different ways that we can become dementia-friendly. And I think it would be a shame for us to, um, again, put the conversation in a box and say this is all it can be when it can be so much more than any of us can even realize. And we've, we've seen that through the growth of what has happened here. So um, I wanna thank everybody. Feel free to push this out and share it. And um, that's, that's why we do these. And maybe we'll have a follow-up with more discussions on this later, because I, I think this was a really, really fascinating topic. So thanks everyone. Bye.